I think there's there is actually a good case for um, for thinking about um, eternity as an endless duration of time. And I know philosophically, some people would say eternity is stepping outside of time. Well, it is in a certain sense, but um, we can't really imagine that. So mm. the closest we can imagine to eternity is time which goes on and on without end. Here we go. Welcome to The Way is Love on the Focusing Way podcast. I'm your host, David Battistella. Find The Focusing Way on YouTube, Spotify, and Apple Podcasts. To access bonus content and extras, subscribe at thefocusingway.com. Memento mori. Latin phrases have a way of tickling our intellect, even when we do not fully understand them. Memento mori. Latin can do a lot with two words. This short phrase translates to remember death, or another translation suggests this, that one remember that one will one day die. One day, our earthly end will have arrived, and it is good to remember this one inevitable, unavoidable fact that awaits every one of us. We will all have our last hour, our last breath, and our last heartbeat. Imitation of Christ, attributed to Thomas Akempis, is the most read book on earth after the Holy Bible, and now we have a new volume by this author, translated for the first time into English by Father Robert Nixon, director at the New Norcia Institute for Benedictine Studies in Western Australia. It might seem like a macabre topic to start a new year, but the book Meditations on Death, Preparing for Eternity, instead brings us to an appreciation of life with a healthy respect for its fragility, and it helps us to ponder and reflect on our use of this precious gift of life that God has given us. Death can be seen as a doorway to eternity and the beginning of our eternal existence. Joining me to discuss this work is the translator of the Latin text, Father Robert Nixon. Welcome to The Way is Love, Father Nixon. Thank you very much, David. Good morning. Uh, death, it seems, Father, is a topic people tend to fear and avoid. But it's been spoken and written about throughout the ages by learned minds. What was your reaction to this teaching as you translated this text and what it reveals? Well, this was uh, this text came as a great revelation to me. And of course, I'd always read very intently St. Uh, Thomas Akempis, his writing, The Imitation of Christ, and he devotes a whole chapter to that book on the value of meditation on death. How it's a constant reminder of the reality of good and evil, that our actions in the here and now have eternal consequences, and that the things of this world, both good and bad, don't last forever. And similarly, in uh, as a Benedictine monk, the rule of Saint Benedict tells us that we should keep death daily before our eyes. So I had always appreciated the value of that, but I guess I'd never really so much about the actual content of a meditation on death. Mm. You know, it's not just to think about it in an abstract sense. And what this book did, well, it really reawakened to me um, to, to the meditation on a very detailed sense upon the reality of death, the physical reality leading up to it, the spiritual reality, all of the fear and anxiety and uncertainty which go with it. And this is this is for everyone. Mm. Um, and then what lies beyond it? The final judgment, the possibility of either heaven and hell. So although um, the meditation on death was a phrase we'd come across very, very often, as I'm sure most of your listeners have, um, this really filled out the content of it in, in very concrete and vivid terms. So it's a remarkable work. And it's a picture, uh, it's a, an insight into spirituality um, of the late Middle Ages, which we, we really don't get very often. You know, we hear about 
late medieval spirituality in a fairly generic type of sense and read a small number of examples of the writings from that time. But, but by and large, it's a, it's a closed book to, um, to a lot of people. So, so I felt very fortunate to, to discover these, book, these works. They're found only in uh, an ancient edition uh, from 1523. And I, I came across them and thought, this, this, is, this is remarkable. And um, sent a little bit of it to, to Tan Books, and, um, and they were very enthusiastic about it. So I, I'm sure that this is going to be a book which touches the lives of many people. It's a, it's a book which, once you've read, it will change your life and your perspective forever. I agree. I agree. And I wanted to ask you why you feel we, we must not shy away from the subject of death and even keep it ever present, as you mentioned, and as many of the saints suggest. So, David, you asked why is it good? Why is it useful for people to meditate on death? And the key to this is that death is our transition into this great eternity. That it's, uh, death is not just a, a once-off event, something which happens just one day and then it's all over. It's the opening of the door to this vast portal of eternity. Mm. And once we go through that, that's, that's going to be our real life, you know. Mm. People worry about what they're going to do after retirement, and that's only for a short period of time, a decade or so. Yeah. You think about, shouldn't we be more concerned about what's going to happen after we retire from this earthly life you know mm. um so it is it's very important very important indeed and it moderates all of our earthly ambitions and temptations and values and so forth we think what are we really aspiring to the things of this world which which are passing uh, which at best provide a kind of partial happiness what mm. are we getting angry and hurt about again Passing things of this world, which in the context of eternity don't matter terribly much at all. We record this conversation after the recent passing of Pope Benedict XVI, and it, 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 during a time of grieving and remembrance and prayer for the soul of uh, his departed soul. Why do you think our present culture has strayed from talking about death? I think we have strayed from talking about death because it raises immediately religious questions. And um, people don't like to, to talk about these, to think about these, the ultimate destination of the soul and so forth, and what happens after um, a person dies. And for this reason, death tends to be um, either swept under the carpet or treated as if it's just a, a medical um, thing which happens to you, you know, like, I don't know, getting getting the measles or getting COVID or something, that you know, this person has died, here's the medical certificate, and, and that's it. Mm. So, um, yes, we live very much in, in this culture which which is, is afraid of death and doesn't like to look at too much in the eye. I think part of it is to do with our um, consumerist culture mm. because... You know, people are selling products so that um, as if the here and now is all that there is. So people striving to fulfill themselves in the present world of time and space. And um, keeping death in mind really points out the limited nature of this present life. And in that context, I guess people are less inclined to, to buy products to, um, you know, follow media and yeah. seek out entertainment so much. So I guess, yes, it is, it is very um, countercultural. Interestingly, it was different in other periods of, of history, particularly in the Middle Ages, when it was a very um, visible reality and something they didn't shy away from at all. Mm. I, I have several quotes of, in the book, but I just would like to read this one. Um, quote, in this world, human beings make enormous efforts to acquire honor for themselves and seek avidly to attain happiness in any form possible. Yet how few make any comparable effort to attain the glory which lasts forever and to secure for themselves the happiness which never ends. And when I read these quotes, you know, we know not the hour, the day of our own passing, 
But what are the important things to consider about our own preparation for death? Yes, and I, I, I really, I think that quote uh, um, is really very touching and striking because, you, you know, makes you think how much time and effort am I putting into things of this world, things which um, at best are going to last only for a short time and more often than not don't end up delivering what they promise. And people really do work very hard for those things. And, you know, the eternal life, the eternal reward, this great glory, which is going to last forever, which is really so important, um, people don't want to put much effort into it. You know, they think, well, if I do the bare minimum, I'll kind of hopefully be okay. Um, isn't it worth putting the extra effort into this into this great eternal life which is going to follow. And not only the acquiring of the eternal life, but the avoidance of the possibility of hell, which, mm. you know, which he talks about quite extensively in this book and describes in very vivid detail. You know, and whenever, um, if a person is tempted, you know, um, a few seconds thinking about the fires of hell, uh, Pretty quickly going to put that temptation into its proper perspective, I think. Yeah, yeah. I it's really literally the next question. The book has a detailed and horrid description of hell. And um, but what would you say to those who simply do not believe in hell or believe simply that um, you know at death all is forgiven? Okay. Well, um, the, uh, this is of course assuming the people believe in God and yeah. the immortality of the soul. Um, okay, there's actually not really a very strong case for that position. <laughs> if you read the scripture, especially if you read the gospel, and uh, Christ in uh, the end of the gospel of Matthew says there'll be a great multitude, and to some he will say, um, Come, uh, ye blessed of my Father, to the reward that's prepared to you, and to the others, um, go from here, ye cursed, into the eternal fires prepared for the devil and his angels since mm. the beginning of time. Now, Jesus says, you know, a lot of times he talks about um, being thrown into the outer darkness, mm. how it's better to have, uh, to enter the kingdom of heaven lame and with one eye then to burn forever in the fires of hell. So it's pretty clear to me that he didn't anywhere say everything's going to be for I mean, that's just um, something which someone, I'm not sure who, mm. thought up themselves that it sounded like a nice idea, but it's, it's you know, it's not supported by, by the scripture. And if everyone was going to go to heaven anyway, why bother with this world at all? Mm. You know, yeah. So this world is our place of of purification, of of preparation for the kingdom of heaven. It's also a place of of trial and temptation, and temptation literally means testing. Um. So we go through this uh, journey, and Saint Paul talks about fighting to win this crown. It's not something you automatically get, you know, and. Um, if we like to think, well, everyone's going to get the great prize at the end of the day, then then why would why would we be living this life at all? Mm. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so I think it's a it's a pretty weak position to imagine that everyone that everything is going to be forgiven at the moment of death. Now, having said that, that doesn't mean that God isn't capable and doesn't desire to forgive us for everything, but um, a, a, a certain effort and disposition on our own part is necessary for that to happen. Um, and, you know, if a person is genuinely sorry, genuinely repentant, of course, they'll be forgiven. But one of the points which he makes in this book is that even the person concerned can't be sure how genuinely repentant they are, mm. especially with the case of deathbed repentance you know yeah so it's my so the person has lived their life in sin and then at their moment of death they they regret all the crimes they committed or the sins they committed or but he points out that they can't actually commit those sins anymore so so they're um 
their repentance at this point is slightly, um, I won't say lame, but, you know, it's it's not backed up by action. They don't have the opportunity to amend their lives. Yeah, yeah. He, 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 well, they don't have the op- they don't have the opportunity of um, carrying out works of penance and so forth. So the possibility of sin, and I think um, Saint Augustine some has used the phrase that it's not so much the person has left sin as the opportunities of sin have left the person. Mm, yeah. So wow. yeah. So um, so at the last moment, you know, it's um, I won't say it's too late, but. It's definitely um, not a good idea to plan on leaving things to the last moment. And even if you do, just the very idea of planning leaving your repentance till the last moment suggests that it's not completely sincere. That doesn't, you know? Yeah, yeah. No, I totally <laughs> um, understand and, that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, so I think th- this is, you know, it's quite medieval. It's different from what most modern spiritual writers would say, who would, on the whole, be tending towards the complete forgiveness at the moment of death. But I, for one, am happy to trust what Scripture says about it, and I'm not about to take any chances. And I think if anyone (laughs) thinks about it seriously, um, you you know, given that no one really knows, the closest we come to knowing for sure is from the words of Christ himself. Mm. Um, But we don't want to take that chance. (laughs) Yeah, I, I agree. I agree. There's another quote. I'm just going to take a step back to that moment of death because um, we we also tend to not 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 only not think about death, but we don't think about final judgment. And there's a beautiful quote here which will lead us to that conversation. Quote: Finally, consider how, after the moment of death, you shall have to stand before that most awesome tribunal of judgment to await your eternal sentence. This final sentence, once pronounced by the immortal judge, can never, ever be revoked or changed. For indeed, it is written in Holy Scripture that, quote, wherever the tree falls, there it will lie, close quote. And now we know our bodies have limited lifespans because of the fall. But can you talk about preparation of one's soul for this moment? Yeah. Um... So awareness of this this final judgment, which we're each going to face, and um, as he says, it can never be revoked or changed. Now, this is not to um, negate purgatory, because purgatory is actually one of the possibilities, which is really the same as, as being saved. It just means that there's a certain amount of purification necessary before that point. Um, but each of us... How, however holy or however not holy we may feel we are, we don't know what that final sentence is going to be. Um, because uh, when we think about what Jesus says, it's, you know, I was hungry and you didn't feed me. I was thirsty. We don't know what we've left out that we could have done or should have done. Mm-hmm. So there's always this element of uncertainty. Um, so I, I think it's a good practice at the end of each day to ask ourselves as, as we fall asleep, you know, am I ready to face that judgment if I don't wake up tomorrow morning, um, if my soul departs from my body and is taken before the great tribunal of God where nothing at all will be hidden? Um so you, you know, it's. Uh, I think that is that's a great preparation for this thing. And and he talks about in the second part of the book, he he says that this the very useful spiritual exercise is to imagine yourself at your own moment going through your mind, regrets for things you have done, regrets perhaps for things you haven't done, and so forth. Um, and of course. None of us can be perfect, you know, um, mm-hmm. but um, to to um, to be constantly criticizing ourselves, to be constantly evaluating how we would go before that final judgment. Yeah, I mean, as I read the text, I felt 
that people in the time it was written, which is around the 15th century, I guess, had a much clearer understanding of eternity than we do today. Um, and we talked about this a little bit earlier, but modern man might be redefining eternity for themselves uh, or believe somehow that it doesn't apply to them. Indeed. And I just wanted to sort of open up the, why is the discussion of eternity still so relevant? Yeah. Um, so, you know, I think this eternity is is something which is terribly important. And you know why it was so important in the late Middle Ages? People were, were seeing, um, you know, a very high incidence of infant mortality, plagues, wars, public executions, and so forth. Um, the death was was a visible reality. That was a real possibility for everyone. Of course, it's a, still a real possibility, but it's rather more hidden mm. these days. Um, and and so the concept of eternity was um, very simple: that the soul lasts longer than death than the, the length of the mortal body. And then it continues to exist. It continues to live. And I think every human being, if they think about the nature of their own soul and the nature of anyone's soul, they realise it's not something which is just um, snuffed out at the moment of physical death. I mean, no one has that sense. We all have a sense of something beyond. Mm. Um, and I think today there's often a kind of philosophical um, confusion about what, eternity is, hmm. you know, as if eternity was um, something which could be just grasped, you know, as if it's a single moment or a single instantaneous hmm. experience, but somehow it's concurrent with our, our present lives, that, that really it's only a metaphoric type of thing, this heaven and hell which comes afterwards. You know, I've, I've heard people saying we either make this world a heaven or a hell for ourselves. There's a certain degree of truth in that, but only a very small degree mm. because people suffer terribly in this world from poverty, from violence, from sickness. It's not their own fault, obviously. Um, and the person who lives the most virtuous, self-giving life in the world, the world doesn't become heaven for them. I mean, it might become kind of relatively peaceful and so forth, but that's a long shot from either heaven or hell. I think there's, there is actually a good case for, um, for thinking about um, eternity as an endless duration of time. And I know philosophically, some people would say eternity is stepping outside of time. Well, it is in a certain sense, but um, we can't really imagine that. So the closest we can imagine to eternity is time which goes on and on without end. And to think of the case of hell, you know, um, I, I myself, I know I don't enjoy physical pain very much. If I have, um, you know, if I have a toothache or a headache or whatever, yeah. you know, I'm, I'm reaching for penadols. I, I just want it to be over as quickly yeah. as possible. Um, to think about Something like that going on forever is, you know, horrendous. And and the image used generally for hell is that of fire. And, uh, you know, from time to time, I guess we've all heard ourselves by, you know, touching something that's very hot or uh, flame or hot water. Or whatever. It's one of the very worst things you can feel. Yeah. And the idea of experiencing that without relief, you know, um, it really um, makes my skin creep, and I think it's such such a powerful deterrent to mm. any kind of sin. You know? Yeah, and you know, the moment of death is really the the moment right after judgment, or that our eternal soul is delivered to eternal life or to eternal death. And so, how does a a life of faith really prepare us for that uh, eternal life? So a life of faith prepares us for the eternal life because faith means that it has been our, um, our focus and our goal all throughout our life. And um, if you, when we attend Mass, you know, if you count the number of times when there's mention of, of heaven and eternal rewards and so forth, you'll find that it's many, many times throughout the course of any single Mass. Um, 
the life of faith for a practicing Catholic means that we're fortified by the body and blood of Christ. And this body and blood of Christ, which is eternal in nature, gives us a share in his own immortal life. Um, it also empowers us with some of his grace to make the right decisions in life, to make the right moral decisions, to choose the good and to avoid the evil. So faith is, is, prepared, is a preparation for this eternal life, you know, and um, the ancient philosophers said that the, a, a, a wise life is actually a preparation for death. Hmm. And that's very true with, with, our, um, with our Christian faith, that we are constantly focusing upon these eternal realities. Yeah, and I mean, there's, so, there's so much to this. Um, I'm just going to go to another quote here. Um, quote, and how foolishly I once wasted the precious gift of time, as if it was of no account or of no value. Yes, I drifted like a ship upon the ocean, letting the winds of vanity and waves of vice push me to and fro, entirely careless and oblivious of my final and ultimate destination, close quote. But some might see yeah. this and believe there's really no hope for a sinner, but can we talk about the role hope plays in our lives? Yeah. So that, that quote which you just read, you know, the reflection that we look upon our life and, and think, yeah, I've just, I've just been drifting around, just kind of doing whatever suits me, whatever chance happens to put in my direction and so forth. With that. And, and I guess most people have that sensation at, at various points in their life, um, you know. And um, we look back and we think, gee, I've, you know, wasted the last few years or mm. few months or whatever it is. Um, now, but having said that, there is always hope because it's as long as a person can think such things, it means that they can actually change them. Mm. So as long as you're conscious, conscious you, you're you still alive, you, you're still uh, in the arena, the result hasn't been decided yet, you know, mm. and um, and and that that you know should not cause people to give up, but rather to um, to make the change. We think about the case of the penitent thief. Yeah. Now I mentioned before that you don't want to deliberately leave your repentance till the last moment, but it can work. Um, in in some cases, we see that he had been a thief throughout his life, and then at the very last moment, he turned to to Jesus with sincerity, and um, and so he was granted the promise of entering into paradise that very day. So I think yeah, it's a it's it's very much a message of hope, um, but not a hope which means you, you you can do nothing and hope just hope without action. Mm. It's a hope which needs to be accompanied by by firm action. And conversion of heart is itself an action. Yeah, and, uh, you know, Thomas Akempis does not shy away from talk of heaven in this volume either and its eternal rewards. And he tries to describe the sort of indescribable nature of heaven and the beatific oh, yeah. vision in human terms. Can you talk about that? glorious part of the book oh yes yes so this is a uh, particularly wonderful so he has uh, there's there's two sections in this book there's within the first part the joys of heaven and then there's also some some poetry at the end um and i think it, it, it's absolutely uh, beautiful what he writes here um i'll just read you a little bit of it um so he firstly says that of course we can't imagine it oh, well we can't imagine it accurately, but we can imagine it to some extent. And even to do that is, is a great thing. Um, so heaven may be likened to a great city, miraculously constructed from the purest gold and the most precious gemstones. Each of its gates is miraculously fashioned from a single immense pearl. And that glorying, gleaming metropolis shall be adorned and surrounded by verdant and gorgeous fields, filled with multicolored flowers of incomparable and entrancing beauty. And in that city, the tranquil warmth and gentle light of spring 
shall prevail eternally, and the air will be suffused with fragrant perfumes, offering ever new and intoxicating delights. And the vividness of its reality shall surpass that of this present life, just as our current waking reality surpasses in vividness and intensity the visions of a dream. Mm. So I, I love that description and the description of the reality and, and vividness of it, that compared to what we experience in this life, this life is like comparing, you know, a dream to, to waking life. Yeah. So it's of a whole different order. And, you know, I think probably a lot of people are struck from time to time with the sense that this world, while it's kind of real in a fashion, is, you know, is actually um, not, not filled with the, you know, complete substance and everything. But, but there's a certain sense in which everything in this world is only, um, I won't say an illusion, but certainly an appearance mm. um, that generally in this world, the good things don't end up being as good as we expected them to be. And conversely, most of the time, the bad things don't end up being as bad as we expect them. So this world, in a certain sense, is a bit like, is a, bit like a dream state, you know? Yeah. Um, whereas when we get to the uh, kingdom of heaven, it's like, it'd be like we've just gone from black and white TV to full color, high definition yeah. TV. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think what comes through partly reading the book and in our conversation is this whole thing of not talking about death is a sort of procrastination. And um, yeah, I'd like to ask you this, Father, because as a as a monk, you live uh, a life structured around Saint Benedict's rule and a life of work and prayer. But how can laity better structure their lives toward God? Yes, um, well, I think that. The principles of the rule of Benedict are very useful, not only for monks and nuns, but also for, for lay people. So his idea um, is what, what's very important in monastic life is what we call our orarium or our daily time table, mm. which we stick to uh, pretty strictly, more or less every day of the year, you know, with a couple of minor exceptions. Um, and so the idea of having a daily routine of prayer and meditation, as well as work, of course, and rest and recreation and so forth. Um, to have, I think every person should have, should live their life according to a, a pretty much regular daily timetable. And it's, it's a good formula for living in a healthy and productive way in this world. Mm. But it's also a way of ensuring that the spiritual life gets its proper priority. And um, I think a lack of, of discipline in life um, causes people, prayer and meditation is normally one of the first things that, that gets put aside, mm. you know, because the, the, the time hasn't been accommodated for that. And most people can't just chop off their work obligations because they basically need to do them to get paid. They can't really reduce their family obligations very easily and so forth. Hmm. Um, so prayer, spiritual life, solitude tends to be the things that get overlooked. Um, I would recommend incorporating times of meditation, times of sacred reading into, into daily life and being very strict about them. I don't mean absolutely rigid, but, but you know, um, in, in a regular way. Um, rule is that the discipline of monastic life can be hard at the beginning, but after a while it becomes um, quite sweet and delightful. And I think it's the same with lay people as well, trying to fashion for themselves a life of prayer um, and spirituality in balance with the other elements of their life, that, that it's a habit which can be difficult at the beginning, but after a little while becomes, uh, becomes very easy. There's uh, these beautiful canticles at the end of the book, and I just wanted to read four lines from one that I really appreciated. Um, oh, yes. And uh, the, the four lines are, The holy saints and angels exult in purest light, but we, the seed of Adam, must wander through sin's night. 
Ah, yes. Uh, that was a little gem that I pulled out of this uh, book. But could you share whether you received any particular insight from translating this volume, Father? Yeah, I, I, I did, I did. Um, so, you know, I, I love these, these poems at the end. And they're from a collection of poetry which Thomas Akempis wrote um, called The Spiritual Canticles, which uh, very interestingly has never been translated into English before. Um, but it, it is filled with those um, kind of, of gems, which are very easy to commit to memory um, and also very beautiful. And um, he is speaking there about um, the exaltation of the saints and the angels in this light. But we, the sons, the seeds of Adam, wander through sin's night. And I think that's a particularly wonderful way of expressing um, our, our mortal condition, um, whether or not we, you know, are, are really active sinners, so to speak, or not, we're all, we are all wandering through this night of sin. We're surrounded by evil forces, by temptations, by the chaotic and troubled world in which we live. And it's night in a sense that we, we don't see our way clearly. We're, we're guided by faith and not by sight. Um, so, yes, I, I was really touched by those. I was also touched very much by his descriptions of, of hell, which are unbelievably vis vivid, and um, his description of the moment of death. I'd like to share with you a little bit um, mm -hmm. from that. And this is where he's talking um, in the person of someone who is just about to die and how death appears to him. And... He says, uh, oh, my God, must I really now die? Can this sentence not be revoked or deferred? Must I bid such a hasty farewell to this world, to the light of day? Alas, how cruel a fiend is death, how merciless and cold and inexorable. But upon hearing this, death, robed in black and with a sickle in his pallid, emaciated hand, retorts, enough of this empty nonsense. Your words cannot help you now one iota. Neither your sighs, nor your lamentations, nor your weepings, nor your wailing can gain for you any remission. For soon you shall enter into my kingdom, the dreadful realm of shadows and eternal night. And there you will behold and experience such horrors, such bone-chilling abominations as no eye has ever seen, nor any ear has ever heard, nor the mind of any mortal even in the state of the most fevered nightmare and delirium has ever dared imagine. But do not protest that this is unfair, continued death, mm. in dreadful and reproachful times, for you knew or should have known the inevitability and the anguish of this hour. You have had sufficient time to contemplate it and to prepare yourself properly. Indeed, you have had your whole life to prepare for this moment. At this, he laughed sardonically, I assure you that earth shall disappear, the sun shall darken, and the heavens themselves shall vanish before you will be free from my cold embrace. Wow, Father, that, if that doesn't inspire us to live well in order to die well, I don't know what will. And, and, this, and this, of course, is a description of the experience of death not just for the person who is a dreadful sinner, but for, for anyone that we're going yeah. to face this, this inexorable, um, and we're going to be led off into the unknown, whether that unknown um, ultimately takes us to heaven or to hell. Um, it's still entering this, this, this dark beyond, no longer being oriented by our, by our thoughts, by our senses, no longer being in charge of our own emotions, you know, Mm. And um, calls to mind to me that line which Christ said to Peter, "You, a time will come when someone else will lead you by the belt to a place where you would rather not go. Mm. And we're all going to be led off to that place, whether it's the place where we would rather go or the place we would rather not go mm. um, is, you know, um, it's still going into the unknown. And it brings to mind the story of a person who, who died and found himself inside a coffin. And he thought, gee, this is a very small and dark room, which has only got one door. 
I must be in an elevator of some kind. So he looks around for a button to choose whether he's going to be going up or down. And he can't find any buttons there at all. So he says, what, what's with this? There's no button here. And then he heard a voice say, you've had your whole life to push those buttons. Mm. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so. yeah, that's uh, <laughs> sobering for sure. It, it is indeed, it is. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I think that, that this is something which we should we all take take in mind to, to think consciously about death. Um, you know, I, I think several times a day is a good practice. In our monastery, we have we have over uh, the door of our oratory um, a crucifix, and this is a Spanish crucifix. It's what the type which has the skull and crossbones mm -hmm. at the base of it. And um, every time we pass into the oratory uh, to reflect upon the certainty and the inevitability of death, and to put everything in context. Mind you, this is not a depressing thing to do at all because um, it, it enables you to cope with troubles and stress which might otherwise get you down by reflecting that they're only passing and to call to mind also the um, reality of the, the wonderful reward which awaits us as long as we continue to walk with Christ. Yeah. Thank you, Father. I think that's a beautiful reflection and a beautiful place for us to conclude our conversation today. But I would like to thank you for the work that you do in bringing these volumes, these um, well thought out books, which were only previously available to those who could speak Latin and for being able to translate them into uh, a language, the language of English, uh, so that uh, poor souls like myself can contemplate these texts as well and many others I hope if they could uh, pick up this volume and and uh, give it some thought thank you David God bless you you have been listening to the way is love on the focusing way podcast like comment and subscribe on YouTube or go to the focusing and subscribe for bonus content and extras